buddy. Hey, We're doing this thing. We are. Texas Whiskey, episode one with Dr. Nico Martini. My name is Jimmy Hayes Nelson. Most people just call me Coach Jimmy. And we are kicking off the very first ever Texas Whiskey Show. Part of it's a podcast. Part of it is video. We're here at the Vocal Studios, which is an awesome setup because we have a little bit of video, a little bit of audio, depending on how people want to take in this show. So we're going to start every episode with Nico. Pour us a drink. <laughs> this is the plan. This is the plan. All right. All right. Well, so uh, today we are we are kicking off with a Balcones lineage. So lineage is kind of the the story behind lineage was basically that um, Jared the um, Jared the master distiller and um, the rest of the team at Balcones they were looking to create some sort of a single malt mm -hmm. that was very price approachable. And so um, they are at Balcones. They are big believers in the idea that um, they want everybody to be able to afford their whiskey. Nice. And, and so um, it's going to be very rare if you see anything from them that's ever o over eighty bucks. Lovely. And you know that kind so of thing. So Balcones lineage. Here's Balcones to show lineage, number one. Single malt. Cheers. Texas whiskey. Texas whiskey. Texas forever. Texas whiskey forever. <laughs> All right, guys, like I said, welcome to Texas Whiskey. And as you have just witnessed, I am sitting next to the biggest brain in Texas Whiskey, my friend, Dr. Nico Martini. We've been friends for 20-something years, which always makes me feel old when I say that. Uh, it my, should. My background, our background, is we met in a theater department a million years ago, and it's been amazing to watch how our careers have gone away from each other in other areas and then somehow crossed each other. So I do a lot of hosting, a lot of public speaking, Nico, as you will learn here in a little bit, we'll get into his story, how he ended up here, how he ended up being the expert when it comes to all things Texas whiskey, and it crossed back over, and we have had these really interesting conversations about Texas whiskey. Mm -hmm. Kind of the roles we will play here is we have, if you're the whiskey nerd, you're the one that knows all the science and the details, and you're like, man, I want to show that we're going to get deep in things, this is your man. And if you're just a guy kind of like myself, yeah, that's you. Like hey. you're the expert. You're yeah. the whiskey nerd and all due respect. And my role in this is I like to drink whiskey. I don't know much about it. So I would like yeah. to learn a little more about what I'm drinking. So why don't we just, why don't you step back a little bit and kind of tell people, how did you become Mr. Texas whiskey? I like that. I like that episode one, the first interview is actually just going to be me. It is. I think, I think that's fantastic. Um, Texas whiskey, how, how all mm -hmm. of this happened. So in um, 2018, I was the uh, uh, director of industry outreach for the San Antonio Cocktail Conference. And um, one of the things that I did in that role was I put together this thing called the Texas Whiskey Summit. Okay. It was sort of, I was trying to do a an event within an event. And so I got a hold of some of the best whiskey makers in Texas that I, that I could know of kind of put everything together at the same time. I was approached by a publisher mm -hmm. to write the book, Texas cocktails. And basically what he said was, um, this is, this is an author for hire. We have the IP for the book, Texas cocktails. Someone's going to write this book. It could be you. It if, could be you. <laughs> if you come to our terms. So, um, I kind of looked at my schedule and it's sort of, it. That's I was awesome. Like, okay. All right. Let's do it. Sure. Why not? And so I researched all of the classic cocktails that come from the state of Texas, and I found both of them. Oh, there were two. Two. <laughs> both of them. Two that came from Texas. Two, which I immediately called the publisher and said, "Yo, uh, this is going to be a book about a hundred different bars and a hundred different bartenders and their cocktails." Now, quickly, I, two questions. So, did they think there were more? native Texas cocktails than there were when they decided to grab the title of this book and to create it? Like, were you giving them news that there were only two? Um, they own New York cocktails and Paris cocktails and Miami cocktails and New Orleans cocktails. And well, that's great. Vegas if you have a name, cocktails. but you don't actually have the subject matter. I guess that's my question, which is hence the author for a hire. Gotcha. So basically, you know, we're going to do the Texas cocktail book. We need somebody to write it. And then they basically just reached out and um, I told them what it was. And they were like, yeah, that sounds great. Cool. Let's do it. So I just want to back up a little <laughs> bit from there because we started with this story and you're like, hey, I'm already at this cocktail festival. I'm already asked to write a book. 
So I'm like, let's take a step back. So obviously, oh, oh. well, let's just, you know. My it's first we're, job was a, <laughs> an assistant manager of a laser tag arena. <laughs> awesome. Not quite that far back. Okay. But I do want, because obviously there's a story here of how you were already an authority. If you have people approaching you to write a book, you've already made a name for yourself. And I know this stuff. Yeah. And so my question to back up just a little bit is when we met in college, I, I did not know you in this world and being didn't. an expert at this. I wasn't in this world. Which so, I guess so. My yeah. question How'd is: that happen? How did Ooh. how did All right. theater major director Nico that I knew, who was also running a social media marketing company, mm -hmm. take a left turn and become a whiskey expert? Before we get to Texas whiskey specifically, how did your just your love affair with whiskey in general start? Okay, so um, I, as you stated, I come from a theater background, and um, in uh, 2006, I was living in New York. I moved back to Dallas to become the program director for Shakespeare Dallas. Okay. And I found myself sitting in all of these marketing meetings. And I was the one who kept saying like, Hey, everyone you just described is on my space. I don't understand why you're not using the internet to try to get people to come see theater. And they were like, well, we don't know how it works. And I'm like, I don't know how it works either, but it can't be that complicated. All of the kids know how to use MySpace. Let's figure it out. So I put together the first digital marketing plan for Shakespeare Dallas. Okay. And that was kind of the moment when I was like, oh, this is just like directing. So ah. the, the, way that, the way that I saw it was um, those who are good, why this has turned into a digital marketing show. Uh, those who are good at digital marketing, they approach it as a story. And just like a director was, you have an audience, you have a particular message you're trying to convey. You have these specific tools to elicit these specific emotions out of your audience. And you're trying to get them to do blank, yeah. whatever that may be. And so if you approach it that way, it's very much a, um, it's very much a, 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 like a directed story. Sure. And so, um, I was like, you know what? I kind of like this. So I started, I went down the digital marketing route and, um, I was approached by my brother-in-law and um, he came to me and he's like, hey, man, I've got this blog. It's cocktailenthusiast.com. And I want to make my blog more popular. How do I make my blog more popular? I want, I want more traffic on my site. And it was March and I was watching a lot of basketball, as, as one will do in March. typical March. Monthly and Monthly. I was like, dude, do a bracket. Like, here, here you, this is the best bartender in Dallas because you say so. Yep. And um, everybody has to come to your website to vote there's your hits. And that's like, awesome. Oh, that's really cool. I'm like, well, dude, if you're going to do it, like go shoot a little video. So you've got something for them to see when they come to your site. And I kind of liked the idea and it exploded into a full on TV pilot. So, um, uh, one of my best so friends, at this point, real quick. So he's doing this cocktail bracket. Are you privy in the cocktail world yet? Or this just no, happened no, 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 to be no. the medium that he came to you because he's like, you understand this internet thing. Yes. I have a cocktail thing. You're like, this is how we'll do it, which yep. led to the, the TV pilot. The TV but pilot. By this point in the story, you're still not like deep diving into well, all, I don't know everything anything. that nerds out in the whiskey world. I got nothing. Okay. Big bag of nothing. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So at the, at the time, um, uh, what, one of my best friends was on a show on ABC. Mm -hmm. And um, I told him, I told him about, about the thing. And he was like, oh, well, who's going to host it? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe Rob. I don't know. Who knows? John. John's yeah. going to host the show. And he's like, well, what, uh, could, could, uh, could I host it? I'm like, yes, TV star friend. Right. You can host my TV pilot. Absolutely. So what we came up with was a show called Cocktail Confidential. Okay. It was essentially chopped with cocktails. Nice. So um, round one, whatever. It's, it's here's your best drink. Round two, it's your secret ingredients. Round three, like the last two uh, bartenders remaining, they have to bartend a whole party, and then you know, you're crowned a winner. Nice. And then the idea would have been to, you do Dallas, you do Chicago, you do New York, and there's a bracket, and then it builds up, and here's the national champion cocktail person. He, awesome. You know, and great idea. Uh, shot the pilot. It was awesome. Took it to, uh, my buddy's agent. The agent was like, yes, I will take this out. So then we head out to LA and we are just meeting with everybody. Sure. Um, we met with everybody. And the moment that I knew we were never going to sell the show was when we were talking to Spike, the now defunct Spike Network. I remember Spike. Is that the man show? Was that Spike? Man show. Nice. Um, Girls on more importantly, Bar Rescue. Ah, so we went in and we're like, Hey, here, here we go. And they're like, guys, 
it's so good. We're not going to buy it, but it's so <laughs> good. And we're like, yeah, like compliments don't pay my rent. Do you, do you mind if I ask why? Yeah. And they're like, we just can't touch it because of the subject matter. Cause it's all about booze. Because it's booze. And I said, we saw it as kind of a companion piece to bar rescue. And they're like, Oh no, that's a renovation show. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. The bar rescue people say there's a renovation show. We're never going to sell this show. Sure. No one is ever going to pick this up. And it was, and it was fine, but it sort of led to, and this whole time as we're working on the, the pilot and we're working on the, and we're going out to LA, I'm getting more and more and more into cocktails. Um, Cause you're seeing all these bartenders yeah. put these things together. So Absolutely. obviously like you're saying, well, what's in that and what is this and why are you using this, et cetera, et cetera. My, my favorite, my absolute favorite thing about cocktails is the fact that you can have this unbelievable culinary experience that is some of the, you, you can go into a bar and have one of the best drinks on the planet and it's not going to cost you more than $40 on the very, very highest end. And you have the, if you tried to, if you tried to do anything else, where you are experiencing some of the best that there is, you think of art, you think of theater, you think of food, you think of travel or think yeah. of whiskey. Sure. Like they're so high cost endeavors. Right. But cocktails, you could literally, if you walk into the into the aviary in Chicago and you have one of their cocktails and they are some of the best in the United States. It'll cost you 28 bucks and you'll be like, man, that's an expensive cocktail. But if you back it out and you think about it from the perspective of, I have an opportunity to have some of the best stuff in the world for under $30, jump, jump at it. And that, that was kind of the thing that attracted me to it the most. Sure. And so it kind of got to the point that I was like, I just, I want more people to have cocktails. Mm. That was kind of, that became the goal. And that was- Came this passion project of, yeah. I enjoy this. I'm going to spread the word as, yep. here's something that you can literally- experience the top 1%, yeah. but it's accessible to everybody. Absolutely. If you got 40 bucks, you can have a top 1% of something in the world. Yeah. You awesome. Can. And so, um, and so I just got further and further into the cocktail thing and we, so we stopped pushing the show. Um, we turned it into a cocktail indie music festival cool. and we started working on the indie music festival aspect and we kept hitting roadblock after roadblock. And, um, uh, eventually, I, I turned to my business partner. I was like, hey, dude, even if this festival goes down, how the hell are we going to serve cocktails to 7,000 people? And he's like, well, I got a draft machine at the restaurant. I'm like, cool. Can we rip it out? And he's like, well, you know, we just need cocktail draft machines. So we wound up starting this company called Bar Draft, um, mobile draft cocktail systems and draft, um, uh, draft ready cocktail mixers. Which was amazing. So again, as we've talked about in this show, I'm Joe just like to drink. Nico knows all the details and the science and the things that we're going to continue to jump into here. And when he told me about this concept, I had just started getting into the cocktail movement. And this is where I want to pause a little bit to say, if you notice the people that are watching the video, we approach cocktails and whiskey a little differently. So for me, every time I jump on any kind of whiskey show, uh, especially if I'm working on YouTube, most of the time, the people on there don't look like me. They are a little more rugged. Uh, it's either lumberjacky looking, hipstery, or, or, or handsome gentlemen like you in, in camo in camo jackets. I am on the other side of this I, is Target. It is Target. <laughs> I've been accused by my friends of being just a little extra um, as I sit here in a custom gray suit. And, and so my my role is for the people out there who have an affinity kind of for things, everything classic, a little Sinatra, a little Don Draper, if I may. And so I like to go to, so what I really appreciate about the cocktails, where most of the time the cocktails you were talking about are happening in these really nice like hotel bars, restaurants, we're not talking about a place where you're gonna go get a solo cup and drink something. And there was something that appealed to me about the timelessness of it. And it really, to be really honest, it reminded me of my Gramps. Because he grew up in that era of the 60s. Yep. And I remember watching him and, and how much attention to detail meant so much to him. And somewhere along the way, I became this affinity for, I am much more about timeless than I am about trendy. And for me, going to these cocktail bars was a bit of like a time warp. Mm -hmm. And just back where people, for lack of a better term, just cared a little more about things, that there was some quality and stuff. And so that's where I became excited about that. About the same time, 
you're coming along and you start having whiskey parties and whiskey exchange yeah. parties and, and things like that. Um, and that's really where I feel like where Nico and I reconnected from as theater friends into both having this affinity for whiskey and he became you became all my go-to everything. If I had a question, yeah. poor guy, if I'm at a, still today, if I'm at a restaurant, let's say I'm out of town and I see a, a huge whiskey list and there's a lot of things that I'm like, Oh, I don't recognize everything here. Nico's like my, my pocket whiskey sommelier. I'm like, Hey man, um, what do I need to try here? What can I find back home? What's uh -huh. rare here? And so for me, it's been really fun. It's like I found this new hobby and it's been cool to have one of my best friends be an expert at it. Yep. And you've been so great about, explaining things to me. What I'm excited about this show is being able to let you do all the whiskey nerd things you want. And yep. every once in a while go, yo, Zach Morris time out here and back up and say, I lost you. Right. You know, because sometimes I think all of us are, are so into something, uh, an expert in something, or we've just geeked out on something. We forget what we know. Yeah. And so we lose people. So you and all the whiskey nerds can just go down and talk about the specificities of like the most random corn or whatever processes we'll talk about. Sure. My job is to look out for the person, you know, that's listening in or watching in right now. That's like, dude, I have no, I love the way this tastes. I have no clue what they're saying. So sure. hopefully between the two of us that we leave no, no drinker left behind is what I want to create with nice. this show. The, the thing, the thing that really resonated with me the most about, about cocktails and then it sort of rolled into whiskey was the, uh, how ridiculously American this is. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, obviously whiskey came from Europe, but <laughs> bourbon is American. Sure. And, um, you know, now we, now we have this, we're establishing this great history of, of American single malt and, um, just the, the direction that we're able to, to, to go with this stuff is, is truly it's just, I don't know, man, there's a pride to it. And I mean, I, that's probably what, what happened with, with the Texas thing as sure. well was like, there's, there's this inherent pride to it. And so just to kind of, to, to kind of jump back to it, the, um, bar draft happens. I kind of, at the same time, I got approached by my friend, Michelle, mm -hmm. who was running a theater, yeah. you know, theater background. And, um, she's like, Hey, um, <clears throat> do you want to do a Ted talk? And I'm like, about what? And she's like, I don't care. I'm like, uh, what do you mean? And she's like, I just need something light. And she's like, what, what's going on? And she's like, well, we're hosting, we're hosting a TEDx and everything. And there's really great, except it's about human trafficking and about death and about just really, was really heavy. morbid. What happens if a pandemic hits in five years? You know, that kind of stuff. And um, <laughs> she's like, I just need something light. I'm like, I can talk to you about uh, the impact of the, uh, the the impact of European soccer on the American sports landscape. Or I can talk to you about digital marketing, but that's boring. Or I can talk to you about cocktails. And she's like, let's do cocktails. I'm like, okay. So I put together this TED Talk that's basically a walkthrough of um, just the it's a very, very short history of the American cocktail. Gotcha. And, um, so that was kind of, that was sort of the moment when I was like, all right, I really do like this. I really, okay. I, I, I do kind of know my stuff as far as this goes at the same time, I start working with the San Antonio cocktail conference. And so that's where that led to, to leads us back to the beginning of that yeah. story. When you're like, you casually like, well, I've been asked to be at this conference and I'm asked to write a book. And so I was like, well, let's just take one step back because to see where this comes from. And, and what I love is the way that you kind of shared it. There was a bunch of us that all went to college together, a bunch of buddies. And there was, what is it? Eight years ago now, maybe six, seven, eight years ago, <laughs> eight years ago, Christmas time. Ah. Um, Nico decides to, um, have a little Christmas party just with the boys. And he calls it the whiskey exchange. He's like, you guys go. And this is when I know nothing well, it was, it was, it was because, uh, my wife came to me and she was like, Hey, so me and the girls are going to do a white elephant exchange. I'm like, cool. What do I need to bring? And she's like, no, no, me and the girls are going to do a white girls elephant club. exchange. <laughs> I was like, Oh, uh, well me and the guys are going to do a whiskey exchange. And I don't know what that means, but we're doing it on the same day. So we're special too. Um, I don't need you. <laughs> I don't need, I don't need your white elephant. I got my own whiskey. So, uh, so literally I, I, I texted a couple of outliers and all of the dudes whose wives were going to be at the white elephant exchange. Gotcha. I was like, yo, bring a, bring a whiskey. 
wrap it up in a wrap it up in a bag. We're doing a white elephant exchange. Make sure it's at least forty dollars, and we're gonna get there and we're gonna do this exchange, and then we're gonna pop open all the bottles and just have a and bunch of whiskey. Drink we'll all afternoon. Yes, yeah, totally. And so that was that was the first whiskey exchange. It since it has that thing has ballooned. Oh, it's become into, its own animal. Yeah, it's uh, we didn't get to do it last year. You know, hashtag COVID, but. Um, Going into last year, we had raised over twenty five thousand dollars. Wow! Uh, for various charities, and so um, yeah, it just it, it came to a point that um, a buddy of mine was trying to put a roof on a school in his hometown in the Philippines, mm-hmm. and he had a bunch of people over, and he you know afterwards he had made everybody dinner, and afterwards he was kind of like, hey, so I have this thing, and we're trying to do, if if anybody wants to donate, that'd be great. And literally, the whiskey exchange was a week later, right? And so I pulled out my phone and I texted everybody. I'm like, yo, uh, it's 20 bucks to come. It's all going to charity. Right. But are you down? You good with this? Like, it's 20 bucks to come. And everyone's like, yeah, of course. Charity? Sure. No problem. And so, like, I scrapped. It's Christmas time. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Scrapped together a couple of, uh, of raffle prizes. And we wound up, like, he was trying to raise two grand to put the roof on the school. And I think we raised $1,800 for him. Yeah, it was and, awesome. I remember that. Yeah, it was fantastic. And it was the, kind of the first time that it was like, oh, we should use our whiskey powers for good and not evil. Right. Right, not we have only, a not only evil, not only evil, <laughs> evil not, enough, not only hangovers. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was awesome. And that, again, another thing I've always admired about you is you're always trying to find ways to use your platform to do the greater good. You know, it's either I'm sharing a passion and something that's brought me a lot of joy. I feel like I want to spread this, which will lead us to why specifically Texas. Yeah. But, um, but you've always had this sense about you of, I found something that is a greater good in the world or brings me joy. And then you just naturally have this way of, wow, if this is really awesome for me. How do I get this out? And yeah. then you create these platforms and create this impact. And, and so while when people are popping into this thing, Texas whiskey, you know, the A number one, that's really specific, or there may be people watching this going, I didn't know Texas whiskey was a thing, mm-hmm. which over the course of this show, we will talk about that more as well. And, um, but that's why I was ex- stoked to do this with you because you have taught me so much. And now this has become a passion of mine. And then specifically supporting Texas, yep. you know, you know, uh, us being here in Dallas, but you know, all over Texas and educating people outside of Texas. My, my stepdad's from Kentucky. So, you know, anytime I heard bourbon, Kentucky or bourbon or whiskey or whatever, there was always that association. Yep. So I was always, and I did, I love that it's, there was something about, I admire places or things that have this, this, you mentioned it earlier, this pride in its history, Mm -hmm. as we'll talk about our our Texas whiskey history isn't very long, but there is this pride about it Mm -hmm. and what makes us different than Kentucky. But that's always what I appreciate about my stepdad and all my family on that side that had, you know, these stories to tell about their experiences or with these whiskeys or at the distillery. So where in this, you know, you've obviously, you started the company, you're helping make cocktails. When did it go from, man, I really appreciate a good cocktail. This is what makes things quality. I can do this, you know, the 1% for $40. When was the next step where you're like, wow, what's going on in Texas people don't know about? And you started creating your next platform and to educate people into what's specifically happening here in the state. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it started with the, it started with the cocktail book. I mean, yeah. you know, it was, it was ba- basically, um, I, I had reached out to the San Antonio Cocktail Conference because they were at the very beginning of their inception. It was probably maybe year two, maybe year three. And um, I went into it, I was still sort of of the mindset that digital marketing. And so I was working with a couple of liquor brands running their running their digital marketing. And it was just sort of a natural like, well, hell, I'm good. I'm going to go get myself a client. And so I go to the San Antonio cocktail conference. We have this nice conversation. I wind up uh, helping them out on the PR front and on the social media front. And then it just sort of turned into, well, Nico just goes all around the country doing all sorts of spirits things. Let's just give him some arbitrary title so that he can just speak about the cocktail conference from a, from the perspective as one who's part of the team. Sure. And it was very like, I wound up for for a while. I was I was um, heading up a lot of the seminar selections mm-hmm. and for the it, festival for the for the cocktail conference. Okay, and yeah, so so getting people to to submit seminars and um, like trying to pull in pull in the best people that I could so that we were we would have a uh, a very high quality event that bartenders and industry people would want to come to. 
consumers, it was great. Like it was, it was super consumer facing. The events were so fun. We're in San Antonio. It's there's barges on the river walk doing right. stuff. And fun. there's, you know, there's events at the Alamo dome and just like all sorts of things. But like on the, on the industry end, I knew that if we could get the right people there, that the conference would keep growing on a national level. Yeah. And there's, I just really wanted it to be the second largest one. There's one that you can't touch, <laughs> but um, I wanted it to be the second largest cocktail event in the U S and I was just kind of doing everything I could to help make that happen. Right. And, um, and then the book comes along. And so, the, and they literally found me through what I was doing with the San Antonio cocktail conference. The and publisher so, did. The publisher did. Gotcha. And so, and so he called me up, the, you know, blind, <laughs> he cold called me. And, um, that's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's nuts. I like don't think he, I ever knew that part of this no, story. He literally, yeah. like literally I had no idea this didn't get an email intro and it was like, hi, I own a publishing company and I want you to write a book. You want to talk? I'm like, this seems like spam, but okay, I'll talk. Sure. Can I pause there for a second. So uh, listening to your story so far, you've just been handed a Ted talk and handed a book. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of favor in your world. That's Hashtag kind of awesome. Hashtag blessed. And very friend. blessed. But you don't get those opportunities if you don't know your stuff yeah. either. So, you know, I, I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to take anything away from you, but this is awesome that you are so you had done this as a passion project for yourself yeah. that was, you know, just naturally kind of bleeding out in other areas that other people noticed and said, "Hey, you're doing this just for you. We would love for you Here's the audience. We would love for you to like teach, yeah. you know, and so that doesn't happen if you're not kind of public, even in your own circles, starting with sure. those of us, your buddies, and then continuing to grow to the conference and then the book. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah. So working on the book, what, what working on the, the cocktail book kind of did was it solidified my relationship with all, with all of these Texas bars and bartenders and, you know, kind of, it was, it was a very cool opportunity for me to put a, put a bunch of people that I love into, into print frankly. Sure. And, um, as part of the discovery for that book, naturally I wanted to talk about Tito. I wanted to talk about treaty Oak because they made the first Texas rum. I wanted to talk about Balcones because they made the first Texas whiskey. I wanted to talk about Garrison because they made the first Texas bourbon. Right. And so I kind of got to know a few of these folks, the, a few of the makers along with, with that, because I wanted them to be part of the, of the Texas cocktail story. Right. And then once that came out, um, it, it sort of shined a light on things that were happening in Texas. I'm hoping I'm hoping the same thing will happen with the next book. And um, it, it kind of showed everybody what was actually happening in the state. And it kind of gave me an opportunity to um, to go beyond Texas and sort of have a reference point to speak to people about it with. And um, so the book the book happened uh, working with San Antonio. And we put together the summit, and the summit was really great. The actually, the Texas the Texas Whiskey Trail launched at the Texas Whiskey Summit at San Antonio Cocktail okay. Conference, which was which was super cool. I, I honestly had forgotten that 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 had occurred, but yeah, it was it was the launch date for the actual uh, whiskey trail, and so um, it <clears throat> it kind of turned into. Um, it just sort of turned into my life. You know, yeah. now I'm doing, now I have my cocktail mixer company and I just wrote a book and I'm working with San Antonio and just sort of, that was just kind of what was going on. And then the pandemic hit. It did. And the pandemic. And we all wanted to start drinking more. Oh. <laughs> it, yeah, no kidding. It's, um, it kind of destroyed the, the draft cocktail company, not because there, it, there wasn't still an opportunity there, but everything shut down. Yep. Nobody's buying any more mixers. That was a given. But um, our investors were a massive hospitality REIT. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, they're losing hundreds of millions of dollars a week. And they turn to us and they're like, hey, guys, we love you. We love you. Uh, we're not going to give you all that money we said, but we love you. We love you. Ah, uh, sorry. You're not our- This is Spike TV all over again. You this is awesome. Basically. We're just not putting money no, into no, it. No, no, we really think it's still going to be a really, really good idea. Obviously, we've given you money so far, but yeah. yeah, the rest, no, you're not our core competency. So good luck. Right. And it was kind of like, oh, <clears throat> um, cool. What the hell am I going to do now? Yeah. And so I called the publisher. I was like, dude, uh, you need to let me write a book about Texas whiskey. 
And he goes, you're not going to believe this, but on my to-do list is to ask you if you want to write a book about Texas whiskey. Hashtag blessed. And I said, yeah, <laughs> now, right now. Right now, I got nothing Absolutely. going on. And so, like, literally, this book saved my mental health. As That's awesome. the industry that I've been working my way into for the past 10 years is collapsing around me, I had stuff to do. Yeah. And so like I had a book to write. So it was it was very much the the thing that I had to put put my focus on and it was it was a very much a blessing that I was having to do that as the as and, the world and, is crumbling. And I remember this because as I said, so during all of this Nico and I are hanging out and there was literally like he's like, "Hey, can we just go talk?" It was a Sunday. Mm-hmm. He's like, "Hey, can we just go talk?" And You know, I I had helped other people in business and branding and stuff. And he's like, he just wanted to throw some ideas, you know, against the wall. And so we start talking about this. And what's really apparent to me is kind of what I already said. I'm like, look, you have something you're super passionate about. And I truly believe that that there is value in just sharing what our passion projects are. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to create not only businesses with that, but movements and really, um, you know, bless other people with what's been cool with us. And so that's right about the time you said that you were writing the book. Yeah. And then I had said something along the lines of, man, you know, what would be kind of cool is we, we should make a show like outside, like people are going to read the book and that's awesome. But I feel like there should be some kind of interactive point piece. And I was literally thinking of myself and my journey with you as your friend is to that point, I had learned so much. And it, and it was funny. We were, we were sitting at standard poor on the patio here in Dallas and I forget which whiskey he had. So every time you go anywhere with Nico, the bartender always knows them, always knows him. And it can be a blessing and a curse, depending on how much you want to drink. It helps to write cocktail and books. It helps to friend. write cocktail books. And so Nico would ask, you know, about a specific whiskey. He had come to port and it was like 120 proof. It was like a really high proof whiskey. And the lady next to us overheard us say that. And Nico's like, hey, do, do you want to taste it? He's like, just smell it. And so he hands over the glass and I watched him do something that I'd watched him do at least a dozen times before is he asked the question because he'd asked it to me, do you know how to smell whiskey? A question I had never thought of before I ever met you. And I'm like, yeah, who doesn't know how to, sm-? like, I got a nose. I don't know how to smell whiskey. And I watch him take him, take her through this very simple little, like, how do you get, how do you smell it? What are you looking for to educate? And I'm just sitting back and I'm like, this is what you were made to do, Nico. Like you, you can't help yourself. This is just what you're designed to do. And that's where I was like, pause. And I took out a piece of paper and I started asking questions and I started writing down questions that were like, Hey, you talked to that bartender and you said three or four things that I have no clue what it meant, whether we were talking about proof or proofing down or bottled in bond or what it, you know, like all the things that we're going to cover over this show. Mm -hmm. So specifically again, If you're like me and you're like, Jimmy, I like a good cocktail. I love a good old fashioned. Uh, Maybe, you know, there's all the, you know, these all these different ways that you can enjoy whiskey and you're more on my end or you are a distiller or you are in the industry or, you know, you have a blog or an Instagram uh, following that's already in cocktails. What we're hoping to do is serve both in in this way. And so what are you most, what are you most excited about for this show? Like as far as we look at the audience and helping them learn more about Texas whiskey. Like what is it that, that you, cause I know you're excited about what's happening here in the state. Like right now, this is the year. This like, is the year. This is the year that Texas whiskey is going to, to hit everyone's radar that it's not already on nice. that, that are whiskey fans. Because there are still people outside of our state or maybe even in our state that don't know that's a thing. hundred percent. Absolutely. And Texas whiskey has been around how long? Uh, <laughs> Texans have been making whiskey for 14 years. Lovely. Yeah, so do we're you know t- how old we're- Scotch is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have some. We have some room to. Get you know how old Bourbon is. Right. We have some. We have some time. So we're in those awkward teenage years. Yes, very much so. Right. Um. So yeah, the the Texas whiskey thing. Um. Obviously, the book is coming out. There there has not been a book written on Texas whiskey. Mm-hmm. Um. The the Texas whiskey book will release on May twenty fifth. Um, please buy it for all your friends and enemies. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, th- this is in in sort of talks with other media entities. Mm-hmm. I'm very aware that the big whiskey magazines are going to be writing all about Texas whiskey this year. Okay. I'm very aware that there are some big distillers in Texas that are going to be winning these 
very international awards. And some already have. We'll get some to that have. as well. Yep. And um, this is kind of this. The, you know, we have we have our own thing that we're we have our own whiskey that we're pushing out that we'll we'll, we'll get into. Right. And um, this is the year that people are going to kind of have this stuff on their radar. And I feel like the the there's so there's so many important things about Texas and about the whiskey that's made here that I just hope that I can be a part of the education portion of the conversation because if, because if I'm not, I feel like because, because if the people aren't the people who are going to be introduced to it this year, who aren't at least just a educated about what it is and what the goals of it are, yep. then I feel like there's going to be a very similar reaction to a lot of the opinions that have been established over the past five or six years. And so there's, we're hoping that it doesn't get dismissed. There's a, there's a very, very there's, simple, there's an old boys club that looks at, you know, let's talk Kentucky a little bit, sees Texas like, Oh, that's cute. This is why it's off. And they're immediately going to dismiss it where hopefully with this show, we're going to talk about, how Texas whiskey isn't trying to be a Kentucky bourbon or isn't trying to be Woodford or some of these that, that are amazing brands that are some quality stuff. But from what I've learned from you is once we wrapped our head around, we are a different climate, like the way we do things here, we're not trying to copy, right. we're creating our own animal in a bit, right? Texas whiskey, the, the greatest asset that Texas whiskey has as a category, as, a, as an entity, is that there is no tradition here. There is no tradition. There is no Texas whiskey tradition because we're creating that right now. And we didn't even. I mean, even if you get into the like the history of like moonshining and back pre prohibition stuff and the people that were doing stuff, it's so minimal. Yeah. Like it, it, it barely, barely, barely exists. And so we're not Kentucky. Yeah. And so when like genuinely Texas whiskey history started fourteen years ago. Okay. And for all intents and purposes, and the, and the thing is, it is not. It is not Kentucky. It's not trying to be Kentucky. There are there are things made here that are made similarly than Kentucky, but at the end of the day, dude, spending four years in a Rick House in, in Kentucky and spending four years in a Rick House in Waco, Texas, are going to make different whiskey. And if you are going into trying Balcones pot still bourbon, thinking, oh, it's a bourbon, it's going to taste like Heaven Hill. It's not going to taste like Evan Hill because it can't. And so as long as you're not like, well, this is garbage. It doesn't taste like Evan Hill. It's not supposed to. It's not supposed to. And, I, and I think it, the greatest comp yeah. you ever told me also was comparing it to wine, mm -hmm. where you were like, a big French Bordeaux is not supposed to taste like something from Argentina. Right. Right. And, and I think that's one of the best. Like when you gave me that analogy, I was like, okay. I get it that it's not all supposed to taste this way or this is what a good mm. bourbon tastes like and this is what a crap bourbon tastes like. And the other thing that I've always appreciated about you is you're here to educate, not tell me what I'm supposed to like. Right. And from from day one with Nico's, we're out tasting stuff. He would, you know, give me samples. What do you think here? What's your opinion on it? And then literally let me decide what I liked. And it wasn't, oh, I like this. So people that are educated like this whiskey and people that are morons like you, Jimmy, like this whiskey. And and then when you have that freedom, you really are kind of, it, it seems silly to talk about this with, with whiskey sometimes, but there's this like confidence and empower thing of like, I know that whiskey. I know why I like it. I was educated on why that one tastes different than this one. And that's, for me, it's been really exciting. Even as somebody that I probably drink more cocktails than I just do sipping it neat like we are here with this lovely Balcones. Um, so, you know, as we're, as we're getting towards the end of this first episode, let's talk a little bit about what can the audience expect? We, we sat down the other day sure. and we talked about, you know, what are some fun segments? Because we really want to have fun with this show. We, there'll, there'll be some serious, nerdy, scientific discussions as we bring in people from, you know, Nico has Ooh. these amazing... I know so many whiskey nerds right now. Yes, we, I know we, I know the nerdiest of all of the nerds. If I can get the nerds here, we're going to nerd out. Right. So, we'll, so when he's here with the nerds, we'll nerd out. And those of us that aren't nerds will learn you and can, drink in the corner. You can sit in the corner. We'll sit in the corner and just taste away. Sippy sip. Um, I think something else that'll be really fun is we're going to do a little, some, some unique pairings. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, dude, it, it, it's, it's the nature of the thing. Like the, the goal of this is to have fun with whiskey. I and love that. And it's, so and not take it. So like, yes, there's some reverence. Yes. There's some nerd out stuff, but just have fun with it. That's why I've never felt 
intimidated by the way you talk about yeah. this. It's one it's one thing to it, it it's such a really fun it's such a fun hobby and it's such a fun tool that you can have and use in um, like your social interactions. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as an example, if I was to invite three friends over to my house and we're planning on drinking, okay, that's cool. Like, you know, probably somebody will show up with a six pack of beer or somebody might show up with a bottle of wine. Somebody might show up with a bottle of whiskey, whatever. Right. But if instead I'm like, no, come over, uh, we're going to, we're going to pair whiskey with Girl Scout cookies. Okay. Because it's fun and you totally can. And so, <laughs> like, yeah, like the, the, it's those are the types of things that I want to I I, I want to kind of highlight sure. as we as we work our way through this. And um, the the thing that I think the most important thing about about this story and about moving forward is uh, just just sort of conveying the information about Texas whiskey and and being available, like <laughs> genuinely. I genuinely don't. Mind if people send me a menu and say, yo, I don't know any of these bourbons. What's what's up with any of this? Now, every now and then I will definitely make you order something that I haven't had yet because I'm curious. Which and happened to me on, my, on last, dime. my last trip. I was like, I got it. It's good. Like, I literally thought I had just came back from a road trip, went to San Diego, then I went to Miami. And he's like, oh, I would try that if I was there. And I was like, oh, right. Dude, I really liked it. He's like. Oh, good. I hadn't tried it. I was like, oh, I just assumed nah. everything you suggest to me, <laughs> you've already had. So I'm glad that I could be your satellite taster in Miami. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So what else? So we have tastings. What else? What are some of the things you want to you know, take advantage of in this show? I mean, we're, we're this is going to include distillery profiles. Um, uh, profiles are easy. Interviews are going to be um, a, a little bit more interesting. Um, I'll be br I'll be bringing in some of my Texas whiskey friends. We will have a super nerdy conversation about corn with the dudes at Iron Root. Yeah, and we'll have a super nerdy conversation about barrel size with Alex from Balcones. And yeah, we'll have a super nerdy conversation about um, wh why why the hell you use rainwater and you stick your stuff in a uh, sh uh, cargo in a shipping container to age it from tie with Thai from Andalusia. Like there, there are so many different approaches here. And what I'm going to try to do is just kind of make it, uh, just kind of open the book and just sort of let everybody know what's going on. Absolutely. And, and so, we will highlight a whiskey every, every episode when we were putting the show together, I told Nico, I said, it, it feels like it's supposed to be like Sesame street to me that at the end of Sesame street was like, this episode was brought to you by the letter a and the number eight. So, <clears throat> you know, I know we're kind of getting to the end, but let's talk just briefly we we've, we've got to know you why this is important you know i think we just wanted to take this first episode just to introduce ourselves um so what are we drinking? Let's take just a little bit of time here at the end of the show to tell me about what we've been sipping on this whole time. Uh, sure. This is the Balcones, the, the Balcones line, lineage. The it's, distillery is Balcones located. They, it is located in Waco, Texas. Balcones is the, uh, they are the makers of the first whiskey in Texas. The first Texas whiskey. Yes, okay. The Balcones. First, the, the first Texas whiskey. It was a. I'm going to set um, that up there. Maybe we can get a camera shot of the bottle. Yes, totally. Um, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Balcony is lineage. Lovely. As you do. All right. So tell um, me more. So wait. So wait. Pour me a little more, and then tell me more. So Balcony's and Garrison Brothers are the two are the first two whiskey distilleries in Texas. Um, Balcony's uh, originally founded by uh, Jared and Chip Tate. Um, they. Here's the story. Oh, tell me a story. Real quick. Here's actually. Pour this, yourself a glass. This is and another story segment. time with Dr. Nico. It's called Whiskey, Texas Whiskey Stories. <laughs> um, so um, Dan Garrison started to, uh, he got he got the whiskey bug, okay. uh, I guess, you know, 13, 13 years ago. Okay. Uh, 15 years ago. And um, he went out to Kentucky and met with just just all of the any distiller that you can think of from Kentucky. If yep. you can name them, he probably met had a conversation them. with them. Um, comes back to Texas is like I'm making a Texas whiskey. At the time, literally the, the only stuff that was going on was vodka. I think there might there might have been I don't even think there was a rum at the time, but um, v nothing nothing's going on as far as distilling in Texas. No one's made whiskey. And so he comes back here and he starts making his whiskey, and then he got a little visit. From um from Chip, who's from Balcones, 
and um, just to kind of check out what was going on. And, you know, they kind of go through the thing, shows him everything, blah, blah, blah. As he's leaving, Dan turns to uh, whoever he was working with and goes, yeah, he's about to make a whiskey. He's about to beat us to market. And they're like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I don't know how he's going to do it, but that squirrely motherfucker is going to. I just cussed. Whatever. That I've been really good this whole episode yeah, so far. This, but, we had a bet on who was going to cuss first. But, so it was you. But that that squirrely dude is totally about to make some sort of a Texas whiskey, right? And um, and he did. So he went. He went back down to Waco. He made this thing called uh, Baby Blue, which is a 100 percent blue corn whiskey, which is great. It's which fantastic. is still on the market now. Um, yeah, yes, it's, it's still on the market now. It's not the five month version that he initially the, sold. So they like, aged it for five months yeah. just to be the first on the market. Yes, basically. Hey, uh, you know, whatever. It is what it is. Balcones has the first Texas whiskey. Garrison has the first Texas bourbon. That's sort of all that really matters. I mean, it is what it is. That was real. That was real hot and heavy. And it was real important at one 14 time, fourteen years ago. Right. But now it's just sort of it's just part of the story. So tell me more about this lineage. Like, what makes this different than the Baby Blue? Then, mm-hmm. so Balcones, uh, as I've learned more about Texas whiskey, is. I love everything that their distillery does. Tell me, but I don't know that I've ever had this. So what makes this, um, unique? This is, uh, this is their, this is their, um, their pot still single malt that they're making with the intention of it being, um, price appropriate. So this is something that you're going to find under $40 in retail. That bottle's under $40, which a lot of their stuff isn't. No, no, no. It's like a a lot of, when you get into the balcony single malts, you're looking, you're looking anywhere between uh, 50 and 70, depending Mm -hmm. on where you buy and depending on what you're buying. Sure. Uh, But uh, this is going to be very, very, very price appropriate. Um, It's a, it's a wonderful American single malt. Jared's doing a lot of work with the American single malt society, as far as trying to get, um, trying to I forget who they're talking to maybe the TTB they're trying to clarify what the American single malt category is going to be mm-hmm. and so um from the get go they've been single malt mm-hmm. like balcones is single malt okay they make bourbon they make rye they make they make corn they make all sorts of stuff but like their pride and their passion it's come it comes from single malt and this is kind of the culmination of a whole bunch of things uh, of of 14 years of making of distilling but getting it to the point that they could have something that they felt very very proud about that literally anybody can afford and that's exciting so. because again going into the things that we're going to bring on this show and nico kind of already touched on it about the one percent thing about you know forty dollars you can have one of the best cocktails in the world but we want to make this accessible to everybody you know and and the fact that you can get something of amazing quality yep. That isn't going to break the bank. That you, you like it? Can, I love it. You know, I would have never thought a $40 yeah. bottle at all. Yeah, it's um, fantastic. And just because it was Balcones, I just assumed mm-hmm. it was more expensive just because as I've been out shopping or I've seen it on the shelves and stuff, I'm like, okay, I kind of know what that price point is. Yeah. So it's fantastic. Is this is this a newer product from them? Uh, this came out last year. Came out in 2020. And and what's the how long has that been aged? Um, this was This came out in... Uh, July of 20, uh, I don't, it doesn't, Did I stump doesn't have an age statement. Gotcha. Right uh, aged at least 36 months in oak. Okay. So, uh, you're looking at at least a three year, which Balcones does a lot of like, if it says at least 36, that's going to be the youngest one. There's, there's older whiskey than that in there. Okay. Like just sort of knowing the way that they approach things, there's older whiskey than that in there. But I mean, regardless, here's the thing, man, age statements, it, it's, it, it kind of. It matters. It matters just because you know how long somebody's gone to the trouble to try to make this whiskey good. Right. But at the end of the day, the age statement in Texas is so drastically different than it is. Other well, and that's what I've learned is older isn't always better. At least with my pat, like the things that I'm like, oh, this has been aged longer doesn't mean necessarily that I like it anymore. And yeah. some of the other things, you know, as we're, as we're wrapping up here that, that we haven't got to touch on today is literally going in and what, you know, Nico and I took a trip recently down to the hill country, visited a, a bunch of distilleries, and we were having some conversations in the car that you'll actually be able to find on Nico's Instagram account, which is Texas Whiskey. So make sure you go to and follow Texas Whiskey. Texas Whiskey Book. Texas Whiskey Book on Instagram. I'm the Coach Jimmy on Instagram. Um, but we were heading down that direction, and I stuck my GoPro up, and I was just like, cool, tell me what, what makes Texas Whiskey. And we had this whole conversation about what necessarily is happening if is everything from Texas? Are there certain things that are happening that we're getting from outside the state that's being aged here? And so in the upcoming episodes, we will get way deep into just because it says Texas whiskey, there's a lot of different 
variables that that go on into what can be what considered a Texas whiskey and what's important to like each consumer mm-hmm. because what's important 100%. to me as if I'm looking for a Texas whiskey may be different and important to you. Yeah. yeah. There are there are bottles of whiskey that I will pay $80 for because of who made it even though I could go get a better whiskey for eighty dollars at Total Wine, right. like in the in the eyes of the you know whatever. But I know the story, and it's more important to yeah. me. And you know, if it gives me the ability to support local, and it, and uh, it gives me the ability to help grow this industry, then I'm going to kind of lean that way inherently. And I feel like so. that's what really that's that's the button on all this. It's about what's the story behind this whiskey, and that's so important. And as someone who has built my career about helping other people with stories, I geek out at the stories and yeah. the opportunity to support local, to take some pride in the state as well. I think we've had a good first episode, man. I think so. So we're mo- moving forward. I think we're going to, we're, we're going to be doing pairings. Pairings. We're going to be distil- d- distillery profiles. We're going to have experts come in. We're going to probably have some bartenders interviews. talk cocktails. Those of you that are more yes. cocktail oriented like myself, uh, we will have some cocktails so you can follow along, learn how to impress your friends at your next cocktail party. Random um, whiskey stories, be it history or just be it a you know, funny story of things going on. Man, there's... the. I just wrote 60,000 words on Texas whiskey. Like I can, every other episode is just going to be Nico reading his book. We're just going to sit here, crack one and just let you read a book. What a terrible show. Okay. We won't do that then, but there'll always be whiskey involved. And man, I appreciate you allowing me to come along this journey and be a part of this with you. Because like I said, I just feel it's an extension of the conversations we've been having for the past eight years, Mm -hmm. you know, as I've been educated and I, and I understand how much more fun this is for me as I get educated. So I thank you guys for checking out episode one. I hope that this has been educational for you. I hope you look forward to where we're going with this. We just wanted to use this first episode to introduce ourselves. And I really just wanted you to see Nico's heart. I know that seems like, wow, that's really deep for a whiskey show, but this is important to him. And and what I've loved is the fact that he's taken this passion and introduced it to me. And now it's become something that I really geek out. It's made our friendship stronger and something else we can talk about. So hopefully as an audience member, uh, we can help you do that as well. Please let us know questions and things that you have. Like I said, holler at Nico, Texas Whiskey Book on Instagram. I'm the Coach Jimmy. Thank you so much for being a part of the Texas Whiskey Show episode one. Until next time. Texas forever. Texas Whiskey forever. (laughs) 